I hope this is this is one of the informal, you know, very informal uh, seminars. And you know, please feel free to ask me anything, anytime. I also have an iPad over here in case we want to discuss things by writing. I can do that too. So, so don't hesitate to ask. Anything. All right. So this is joint work with uh, Itai Arad, who is at Technion in, in Israel, and David Gosset, who is uh, at my previous location at NIQC in Canada. Uh, the archive number is over here. Uh, it came out quite recently uh, in March, earlier this month. So uh, let me start with some introduction. There's going to be five sections here uh, uh, in very natural fashion. I'll tell you about uh, everything here. Uh, so let me, let me tell you about uh, uh, what this whole thing is about. It's about uh, these spin systems, which are uh, particles you, you would expect, the systems of particles you would expect to see in nature, uh, they interact via known laws of laws of physics as the interaction is supposed to be local so uh, very formally uh, for this talk we'll consider a square lattice lattice uh, this lattice will consist of lots and lots of particles uh, so uh, in blue i've shown all the particles and they'll be interacting so for now i'll make an assumption i'll assume that the interaction happens in certain manner just for convenience uh, uh, so, for example, we'll assume that the interaction between these particles happens through these plaquettes, where H is certain Hamiltonian acting on these particles. Uh, they could be Hamiltonian acting all, all across. So, H is an operator. Uh, it's we will assume that H is positive semi-definite and it doesn't have very high eigenvalues. So, it's bounded between zero and one. And uh, this single H specifies the interaction between a certain collection of four particles on the plaquette, but once you uh, bring them together, you you get the full interaction. So that'll be the Hamiltonian of the system. So uh, once more, uh, we have a collection of particles uh, and they're interacting locally by this Hamiltonian, where uh, any Hamiltonian, any term Hij, it acts on certain particle Ij and its four neighbors in the plaquette. And it doesn't act, it acts trivially on everything else, acts as an identity. So H forms a big matrix on these particles. So uh, just to clarify, uh, L is the length uh, across of, of this square lattice and N is the height. Uh, so th there are lots and lots of particles, like N times L of them. Now, uh, there are a couple of important concepts when, it, uh, when, when we talk about such systems. Uh, one of the most important quantum states that live on these particles is known as the ground state. So the ground state, it's the it's one of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, which has the smallest eigenvalue. Uh, eigenvalue is also called energy. So it has the smallest energy uh, with respect to the Hamiltonian. Uh, another important quantity is the spectral gap, which is the difference between the smallest and second smallest eigenvalues. Uh, uh, I'm sure uh, many of you might have seen the notion of spectral gap. Uh, so I won't go much deeper into that. Uh, uh, one more notion that we'll use is that of local gap, which is the spectral gap of the Hamiltonian uh, when we're looking only at a, every possible square. So uh, you look at all possible square on this particular lattice and look at the Hamiltonian on that square region. Uh, I'm assuming you can, you can see the cursor uh, over here. And if you look at the Hamiltonian defined on this square region, it has a gap and, and the minimum over all possible squares with the local gap. So local gap is usually uh, could be smaller than spectral gap, but uh, it's not known whether they uh, they will be too far away from each other. So, um, uh, given this, uh, for this talk, uh, one very important notion will be that of frustration-free assumption, which I'll call FF in short many times. And what it basically means is that all these local interactions, HIJ, uh, which are the Hamiltonian terms, they also see the ground state as a zero, zero eigenstate. eigenstate. Which means that the ground state it satisfies all the constraints, all the, all, all these Hamiltonians. So, if uh, one way to see from the computer science point of view is in terms of this constraint satisfaction problems, so you could think of each of these HIJ as a quantum constraint, and frustration-free assumption is basically saying that the constraint satisfaction problem is satisfiable. That is, there is a solution to all the constraints. Uh, you could think of it that way. Uh, 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 which I think, given the audience, I can assume that everyone already knows what these are. Uh, but all right. So yeah, so this is the frustration-free assumption, and uh, 
Uh, one remark, uh, it's somewhat technical, but uh, it'll come up again in one future slide, uh, an important slide. Uh, it is that frustration free assumption allows us to assume that these HIJ are projectors. That is, uh, they either give zero to some eigen, any eigenstate or give one. They don't give any value in between. Something like constant satisfaction problem. You, you see uh, either the constant is satisfied or not satisfied. So uh, in a very similar manner, uh, we'll assume that the frustration, that frustration free with each term being a projector. This assumption don't, doesn't really change anything. Uh, our, our important quantity is at the ground state. It doesn't change the ground state. And our next important quantity is the spectral gap. And it just changes the gap by a constant, which doesn't matter for us. So we are assuming these two properties. And now comes the, uh, you know, the, key, um, the key player in this, in this whole concept, which is the entanglement entropy. Uh, so look at let's let's say we have a ground state on these n times l particles, uh, and we divide these particles into two parts. There is a region A and its complement, which is a complement over here. The boundary between these regions I'll denote it by the boundary in this symbol, boundary of A. And the question is, uh, what is the value of the entropy of the reduced state of the ground state on this part of the lattice? So very, very quick reminder, uh, entropy is defined in this way, it's the one moment entropy. So this is the question, uh, and let's see what is uh, known about this. So uh, wait, so what's known about this will come soon. Uh, so here's, here's a uh, very important conjecture about this question, which is known as the area law conjecture. And it says that it posits that the ground state uh, especially if there are not so many ground states. Uh, if there are a few ground states, then it doesn't matter. Uh, the ground states of uh, this gapped Hamiltonian, uh, if the Hamiltonian is gapped, they satisfy an area law, which means that the entropy scales as the size of the boundary. So that's the area law condition. And turns out that most quantum states satisfy volume law, which means that their entropy scales as the number of particles uh, on this on the full lattice, on the full side of A. And if it's a regular square, if N and L are the same, then you can, it's, it's easy to see that the volume is square of the boundary. So most quantum states on this lattice would satisfy a volume law that's the square of the boundary. But area law posits that the ground states are very, very special and they satisfy uh, an, a much smaller entanglement behavior, something like the area of the region. So, uh, yeah. So yeah. To Get the entropy, like do you need the partition in the middle or like anywhere can you? Okay? Uh, yeah, yeah, you can define it for other. Uh, so if you can have a rectangle, for instance, that's also okay. Uh, and it always goes like volume, you know, for general uh, case. In, in general, yes. In general, you take, uh, yeah, uh, a random quantum state will satisfy a volume law for every partition, just by counting argument. You know, the number of partitions is not that many. Uh, simple ones simple ones are not that many but the volume is a lot right the number of sorry the number of quantum states is a lot so uh there will, most quantum states will satisfy a volume law across every every partition mm -hmm. uh, so area law is really saying that hey look ground state is really special because uh it satisfies an area law across uh i guess uh it's a conjecture so one is free to choose what kind of partition uh for us this one is the most natural one. We also can consider rectangles. Uh, uh, triangles and all can be reduced to rectangles, so it's not too hard. Uh, but, you know. uh, so anyway, so, so that's, that's the conjecture, uh, which, which is that the most quantum states uh, satisfy volume law, but ground states are expected to be much better. So our main result is that uh, the ground states of uh, locally gapped, that means uh, Hamiltonian, frustration-free Hamiltonians, which have a local gap that's a constant, in 2D, they satisfy an area law of this form. Uh, it's, it's very close to one, almost one, and this term goes to zero as the size increases of the system. So that's the area law. Uh, um, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, it also applies when the boundary is a rectangle, but uh, with a small change that the local gap is mentioned that I told you earlier, it's not just over a square, but also some L-shaped regions in the lattice. That's why I skipped talking about this for this talk. And if you're not interested in all this area law business and so on, then you might be interested in polynomials, uh, uh, if many of you are computer scientists. So uh, another takeaway from this talk would be, you know, sort of a progress on 
the theory of polynomial approximations for functions in non-commuting variables. So we'll see how that plays out. So uh, if you're interested in either of these topics, then please stick around. Uh, OK, so um, let me spend a couple of slides giving background on what's known about this problem. Um, so it's a very well studied problem. Uh, and in 1D, it's extremely well understood. Uh, I would say 1D has, in 1D, this has been a very successful line of thought. So Hastings in 2007, uh, in his breakthrough work, he showed that if you have a 1D system of a certain number of particles, uh, L particles, with, with similar interaction happening between this, these particles, and he didn't even need the frustration free assumption is for any such gap system. Hastings showed that the ground state satisfies, if it's a unique ground state, then it satisfies an area law, which is exponentially in one over the gap, which is a constant uh, for, the, for the area law convention. And then uh, soon afterwards, uh, uh, these authors, they introduced uh, several computer science, uh, sort of computer science type ideas, and they exponentially improved this result. So for instance, in 2012, they showed that for frustration free ground states, uh, you can improve this to one over gap cubed. And then in a follow-up work, they proved that for all ground states, you can improve this to one over gap, which is believed to be tight due to some physical uh, reasons. Um, a, conse a consequence of all this uh, development over so many years is, uh, is that uh, is that the 1D one, one area law ensures that uh, the these ground states, they have really a very nice and simple structure. And this structure comes from what is known as a matrix product state. So these results show that these ground states can be approximated by uh, something that looks like this. It's not important for the talk, but for those who know about this already, let's a recap, uh, that, it, that, the, uh, that it, this VX is a matrix product state, uh, more or less, with a small bond dimension. And in fact, uh, this, this, this research supports the success of what is known as a DMRG algorithm in very well known in, in condensed matter physics. And in fact, this line of work has given, have, has really supported the success of DMRG but by giving efficient algorithms for ground states, by proving that ground states in one dimension can, gap ground states in one dimension can actually be uh, classically represented with an MPS uh, in a very short time. Now in 2D, uh, there has been several works uh, for area law. Uh, so let me quickly tell you a couple of them, which I remember. Uh, so under various assumptions, so for instance, assuming that the number of eigenstates are not so many, uh, uh, these authors showed area laws. Uh, if it's a spin half, uh, if the particles are spin half qubits instead of qubits, and interactions are really nearest neighbor, then using Bravi's exact solution to this problem, uh, some authors have also shown area laws. Uh, uh, under some other assumptions, like adiabatic, coming from adiabatic uh, computation, uh, assumption specific heat. But these assumptions do not relate to spectral gap. Uh, so I won't talk about them anymore. One very interesting point that uh, I would like all of you to keep in mind is that if the Hamiltonian is commuting, uh, that means if each term is commuting, for example, a classical constraint would be an example of that. Or if you know about toric code, toric code is an example of this Hamiltonian. For commuting Hamiltonian, area law holds in all dimensions, uh, and the proof is very, very easy. But this will be an important point later. So. Uh, uh, the only takeaway from this slide would be, I'd say this, this particular sentence over here. So uh, I'll spend a few slides uh, giving some intuition about how does one go about bonding entanglement uh, in these systems, in these ground states. Uh, what are the tools available and what we expect? So, uh, so the, uh, a very natural approach is that, well, ground state, uh, I have no idea how it looks like, so let me try approximating it with some, something simpler. So an important notion in this context is that of Schmidt rank of the operator, of an operator. So given an operator K, which acts on all these n times L particles, I'll define the Schmidt rank of the operator as the smallest number D, such that I can expand K as a sum over independent operators. Uh, so as a sum over uh, D number of operators, one of them only acting on the region A and one only acting in the region A complement. Uh, and you expect this to be a natural thing because imagine this operator acting on a product state, let's say what, something acting on the left and the right side, then, then it's, it's not very hard to convince yourself that the uh, entanglement in the new system will be at most log D. So Schmidt rank captures the amount of entanglement that is generated by these operators. Okay. 
and we're going to denote it by denote it by S, S R of Cauchy triangle. Okay. So now here's an approach that one could try, which works, uh, which in fact works very well uh, in very few cases actually. Uh, it works. It works, for example, in this first assumption, if there are this assumption about the energy eigenstates. So this thing is that suppose you had a operator k, which was positive semi-definite for for technical reasons. Uh, I'm going to call it imaginary, but because it won't exist really. So let's say there was an operator k, which some hypothetical operator, which approximated the ground state in L1 distance, in trace distance, by a very small number epsilon. And this operator had a very small Schmidt rank, uh, some tiny number. Then one could easily use uh, st standard continuity bounds for, uh, for quantum entropy to argue that the entropy of the, the ground state is less than log of this small number plus this factor. And if epsilon is small enough, then this is pretty, and small is small enough, then this is good enough. Uh, so small would be a function of epsilon. So everything played out, uh, this line of work would have worked uh, for proving it at all. And it does, for instance, in the, when you assume low energy, low, small number of low, low eigenstates. But in general, this never happens. In, like for most general systems, you can imagine, uh, this really doesn't happen. And one, what's one is left with uh, is an operator k that approximates the ground state in infinity norm instead of L1 norm. So L1 norm is very rare to come back. And one has to usually deal with infinity norm, which is much harder in practice, where the error is epsilon. So uh, these, these works really uh, uh, initiated the study of these, these operators, these actual operators uh, in this context. And, uh, uh, the two key quantities that, that they considered was the following. The first is how close the operator K is, is from the ground state that, which was, I showed this as epsilon in the previous slide, but I'm going to rename it as Delta and just following the literature and the Schmidt rank of this operator is D. Uh, for frustration free systems, we also assume that K ground state is a ground state of K, but, uh, this will very good at this point too much. So here's a theorem, which, uh, these authors proved, uh, building upon the work of Hastings, which is that if the if this param if the Schmidt rank and the approximation error, d and delta are less than half, if there's a very nice trade-off between these two parameters, which henceforth we'll call the AGSP condition, which stands for approximate ground state projective. In this case, the entropy of the ground state can be bounded by twice the log the number d. So this requires some proof. Uh, I will not do that right now. I could do it later if you want to hang around. Uh, we can do it on the iPad, but not now. Uh, rough intuition would be that let's say delta was zero. Let's say k was exactly the ground state. Then, well, yeah, k is exactly the ground state because now since k has uh, Schmidt rank d, then ground state also has Schmidt rank d, and it's clear that the entropy will be at most two log d. So when delta is zero, it's very easy to see what's going on. When delta, when this, when this property holds, then it's slightly hard to uh, prove things, uh, but uh, you don't want to do that. All right. Uh, another important contribution of these uh, this line, this line of work was to construct K in a very interesting way, which might appeal to computer scientists particularly, which is to view K as polynomials of this Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, I'll explain very quickly what, what does that mean. So the ground state, in fact, can be viewed as a function of the Hamiltonian. And how do, how, how do we do that? Uh, let me define this function f ground, which is one exactly when x is zero and it's zero otherwise. So now when I feed in the Hamiltonian inside the ground state, what comes out is the ground, sorry, when I feed in, feed in the Hamiltonian in the ground function, what comes out is the ground state of the, of the Hamiltonian. Simply because all of the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian just get killed by the definition of the function, only this one remains. So here's a function which is very ill-behaved. It's it peaks at one point and it's zero everywhere else, and it's natural to expect that you will want to approximate it. Uh, so I'll go and I'll talk more about uh, this polynomial approximation in, in in the coming slides. But let me quickly explain why polynomial approximation. Uh, yeah, exactly. Approximate f ground using tools from approximation theory. So let me explain why polynomial approximation seems to be a nice way to understand Schmidt rank and so on. So let's say this polynomial k of h has degree d, some small number d, and its approximation error is something e to the minus s. Uh, so what do we really expect from uh, this uh, from this polynomial? 
we expect that the Schmidt rank of this uh, this operator k, which is degree d polynomial, would be roughly like exponential in the degree d. And the intuition for this is to think of a multi, you know, if you take this polynomial, let's say, if you take s to the power d, for instance, and if you expand this out in the uh, in terms of the multinomials, in terms of the original Hamiltonian terms, then you'll see terms of this form h71, h73, and so on, which which is a product of d Hamiltonian terms, these small tiny packets. Uh, in the worst case, these would be increasing the Schmidt rank. Each of them would increase the Schmidt rank by a constant because each of them is small single bracket, and d of them would would increase the Schmidt rank by exponential in the constant. So I, I'm not very precise about the constants here and so on. Uh, uh, sorry about that, uh, but but this is the reason why one expects that Schmidt rank scales in a certain nice fashion as a function of d. So if you recall the AGSP condition that d delta was less than half, it basically boiled down to finding a polynomial where the small d is less than s. Whenever that happens, d delta is less than half, and AJSP condition is satisfied. But turns out that uh, even this is hard to get uh, in practice. So this is going to be a technical slide. Uh, uh, by the way, so all the slides which have red title are going to be technical. Uh, and uh, you could ignore it if you don't want to go deep into these topics. Uh, you could think of this as morally what we do. Uh, but, uh, but let me spend some time on this. So uh, uh, it's possible it's possible to set up some condition which sort of makes uh, this polynomial approximation work well. So it goes like this. So let's recall our ground state with all the particles. Here is our cut partition of the lattice, and let's pick up a certain region T, which we'll fix later around the cut. We'll think of this region as certain effective region, and morally we'll forget about everything that happens far away from this region. So uh, uh, we'll think of this region around the cut of certain length t, ignore everything that happens outside, uh, and we'll try to build polynomial AGSPs, which are polynomials uh, labeled by this number t, which have a degree d as labeled by t again, but degree only in the dark blue region, the Hamiltonian terms in the dark blue region, and some approximation error with the minuses. So if you could construct such an uh, AGSP, uh, such a polynomial with a certain degree d as a function of t uh, in this region, uh, ignoring whatever happens outside, uh, you can take my word for it. Then essentially, uh, what uh, very morally, like at a very high level, what was what was shown by this by this polynomial approximation results is that instead of this condition that if d is less than s, one can relax that if degree is less than t times s, where t is the width then the AGSP condition is satisfied and the entropy is bounded by t times the area, maybe still the volume of this region, roughly. So instead of satisfying this rather hard to get condition, one tries to satisfy a rather easier condition. Uh, but turns out this, I mean, this is not so easy, so we'll see. Um, any questions so far, uh, especially for this technical slide? Cool. So uh, all right, so so this is the condition that we're going to use quite many times. Uh, so sorry if you did not uh, understand. Let me see. So yeah, it's very simple. D is a function of t less than t times the approximation. So we'll just keep keep that in mind. So now comes the uh, important part, which is the polynomials, and uh, let's see how these things play out. So okay, back to this ground function. So here's a picture of the ground function. It's the blue picture. Uh, so it's zero. So on the x-axis is labeled the spectrum of the Hamiltonian. And on the y-axis is the function. It's one when the energy is zero and zero otherwise. If there is a gap in the Hamiltonian, uh, which is a certain space between zero and the next eigenvalue, then notice that uh, you can try and approximate this function. Also notice that uh, because this region has size t times the area, uh, the Hamiltonian, we will think of Hamiltonian as only relevant in the region from zero to t times the area. So again, this effective region will come into play. So here's my function, it peaks here. And I'm interested in approximating this function uh, by a polynomial, which is the green line, which takes a value one as the function at zero, but being close to the function, it stays small in the rest of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, starting from a gap all the way to the maximum eigenvalue. That's t times area. And it was known, uh, 
it has been known for a very long time since 1800s that Chebyshev polynomials are the best ones to achieve this, uh, which was used by these previous works of Arad Kitab and Ovazran. So for a given degree, Chebyshev polynomials are the best ones at doing this job at approximating the function. So let's go into the details of how that plays out. Uh, another red slide. So uh, Chebyshev polynomial, it achieves the following parameters. It achieves a degree which is square root of the, uh, of the uh, norm of the Hamiltonian, that is square root of the whole range, that's t times area. And the approximation error is a constant. And this is the same thing that happens, for instance, in Grover search, of, for example, where uh, Grover search solves the AND function with root n queries, same kind of phenomenon. So Chebyshev polynomial achieves this degree, and uh, it has constant approximation error. So let's recall our condition, d is less than t times the approximation, and let's try to play with this, play with this number. So if I want to satisfy this condition, I put these numbers in, and you see that root t times area less than t times a constant, because st is a constant, says that t must be large. t must be the as large as the area itself. So if, then, then if I look at the, the result, which was shown earlier, uh, the entropy is t times the area, I find the entropy is the volume. So it still gives the volume law. And uh, as a result, the Chebyshev approximation, which works very well in 1D, where the area is one, it's a constant, so nothing matters. In higher dimensions, especially in 2D, uh, we get square of the area, and that's a volume. And unfortunately, Chebyshev polynomial approximation doesn't work for 2D, but it works very well for 1D. And, uh, it's sort of very core to all the good results that, that I discussed earlier. So now here's a bottleneck. Uh, and you know, uh, whenever we have a bottleneck, like the one recently, um, often we have to start somewhere and try, you know, try doing something about it. So we'll uh, start some, in a very similar fashion as this picture, we'll start in a very simple, simple place. We'll start in the commuting case, which uh, I mentioned earlier already has an area law. Uh, so commuting case is an area law, but uh, if you notice, this Chebyshev approximation will not work even for the commuting case. So what's going on? What's missing in the understanding of Chebyshev polynomials or the commuting Hamiltonians? So uh, let's talk about that. So the key, the key to resolve this issue that the uh, Chebyshev approximation doesn't work for the commuting case, but there is an area law in the commuting case, is to uh, uh, Try and understand this approximation a bit better. So we'll talk about improved Chebyshev polynomial approximations, uh, which happens for very special scenarios. So it turns out, which I didn't uh, mention earlier, if you have a commuting frustration Hamiltonians, then they have an integer spectrum, just like classical constraint satisfaction. If if I have classical constraints like the and of a collection of variables, for example, then the spectrum of such a Hamiltonian will be integer. Uh, it won't be continuous like in this picture, uh, uh, the one over here. So for a quantum Hamiltonian, the spectrum will be continuous, but for commuting Hamiltonian or even classical Hamiltonian, the integer, the spectrum will be discrete on integer points. So this, these authors, uh, they had shown something which I'll call the super Chebyshev polynomials, which approximate the ground function, which sort of generalize the behavior of Chebyshev polynomial. And they approximate the ground function only on the integer point and nowhere else. And what they do is achieve, uh, much, at least from, from the point of view of this talk, much better approximation that Chebyshev does. So what they achieve is an approximation, which is exponentially small in S, if you recall my notation, of the following form. It is d square over the t times uh, the area. So just to recall, the Chebyshev formula would achieve square root of this number, that means d over root t times area. But this number achieves square of that thing. So especially if d is more than root t times area, which is the place where Chebyshev works. So going beyond that, these polynomials do much better of certain nice form. And in fact, this polynomial was also discovered independently uh, by uh, these authors uh, in the context of quantum query complexity, but they were thinking about quantum query complexity for very small they're thinking about solving, doing Grover search for very tiny error. And uh, simply using Grover search doesn't work and one has to uh, be more clever and they found that this kind of behavior exactly what happens. All right, so let's take our uh, 
better problem and let's do the same analysis that I did earlier. So uh, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to set B to be as large as possible and S becomes T times the area just by the simple maths. So if you look at this condition, D is less than T times S, uh, it's clear that uh, even if there are big constants here and there, this will be satisfied with T being a constant. And hence the entropy will become T times the area, which is the area, which is the area law. So we see that uh, by looking closely at the Chebyshev behavior and improving it for the commuting case, uh, we actually get back to area law and we kind of fix this issue that was there in the Chebyshev approximation. But the issue is that there's no hope that we can use this construction in the uh, in our case, which is the quantum Hamiltonian, simply because quantum Hamiltonians don't have integer spectrum. And their construction by no means can be generalized to continuous, not to the continuous spectrum of a non commuting Hamiltonian. So th that's, that's the major bottleneck, uh, even in this line of thought. So now I'll talk about the proof area law. Uh, if there are questions, I'm happy to take. Uh, so far. Uh, hi, Anurag. Hey. Uh, continuous spectrum as in the eigenvalues, right? You mean the eigenvalues? Uh, or yeah. Yeah, so I can what do you mean yeah. by spectrum in this case? Oh, eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. Sorry. Eigenvalues, yeah. like even for Hamiltonians, eigenvalues are discrete only, right? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. But very fine in the sense that uh, for the commuting case, the, uh -huh. the spectrum is like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 10, uh -huh. this. But for, for, for any non commuting Hamiltonian, it's like very, very dense in this region. Okay. And there's no hope to, to generalize those techniques uh, uh, such a spectrum. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, so, so our approach, which will will lead to the will lead to the result, will be uh, essentially achieving this super Chebyshev behavior in a new way, uh, which will be quantum friendly. Uh, and we'll see that it will apply to. Uh, these 1D local Hamiltonian systems, this frustration for locally gap ones. And we'll do this uh, in, the, in the next few slides, this first two part. And then we'll see how to apply this 1D construction to 2D. And the picture to keep in mind is that uh, uh, we'll be applying this construction on the boundary of the 2D. And because boundary is 1D, that's the area, that's a 1D shape, uh, this result will help. Uh, so that's the overall approach that will follow. So let me start first by achieving this super championship behavior in a new way, which doesn't rely on the integer spectrum. So let me do this for a uh, uh, simplest possible Hamiltonian that I can think of. This is the classical Hamiltonian uh, of the following kind. So we have n, n number of uh, bits. If you recall from the previous slide, n was the width, but I have sort of called n as the length here. That's for good reason. It's not a typo. So n is not l, it's n, and it'll come again later. So think of n bits, uh, and think of a Hamiltonian which basically doesn't want one on each bit. So Hamiltonian is sum over one on each. It penalizes one on each bit. So the solution to this kind of Hamiltonian is a simple 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 at classical string. And we aim to approximate this, uh, this uh, object. 0, 0, 0, uh, this string with a polynomial. Now, if you recall this ground function at ground that I showed, the function that takes a value one at all zero string and zero otherwise is the AND function. So we are thinking about AND function. So we're thinking about polynomial approximation to the AND function of these uh, N bits. So our strategy is as follows, uh, which as you will see, doesn't rely on integer spectrum at all. So we take our AND function on N bits. We divide this into N over M groups of and function on m bits for some small number m, and you compose it. So we take n over m and a copy of m copy, n over m copy, and then, and then we just feed all of them into a bigger and function. So we do a two layer thing. Now, the strategy is that we st start by approximating this inner and function with a Chebyshev polynomial at a constant error, which works despite integer spectrum, it just works for any, uh, for any M. Uh, and degree is roughly root M. This is the gr grower kind of behavior. And then uh, 
just like I'm composing this full, these small ends into a full end, I'm going to compose here as well, these approximations into a full approximation, but we have to be careful about that. So if I simply take this n over m copies of this and function and approximate each of them with this polynomial q and simply multiply them together, error will multiply. Error will become n over m times the original error of one over ten. This is a very bad strategy. Even if you start with a much smaller error, uh, things still don't work out. Uh, I hope you can believe me in that. What has to be done is that one has to compose this very carefully. And this composition comes from what is known as the robust polynomial. So which was, uh, uh, which was uh, th this problem was solved by Schwarzschild in 2012. And, and basically it's a toolkit to uh, compose uh, polynomial approximations, uh, which you don't want to do. In a, uh, you may not want to do this in a usual, usual manner, but one does it in, a, in this fashion. And in fact, uh, uh, the construction is simple enough that, uh, uh, you know, later I could describe if someone is interested, uh, how does this actually work? So at least for, for our, our case. So what we'll do is that we'll, uh, we'll take our and on M bits, uh, we'll approximate each of them by this polynomial Q, and instead of just multiplying them together to get the full approximation, we'll multiply them in this robust manner. We'll take a robust function of these Q and over M functions. Its degree will be very similar to just multiplying these polynomials together. So if I just multiply them together, I would get the degree of the new polynomial would be n over n times the degree of the original. But the error doesn't accumulate in this bad fashion, rather it gets much better. It becomes exponentially small in the number of inputs to the robust function. So now if I just put numbers in, recall the degree of Q was root M, that's the Grover part. So the overall degree as a function of the number of particles here, number of bits, d of n is n over m times root m, that's like n over root m. And the error is, which I'm defining as n, is just what I showed here, it's minus n over m. So now this is exactly the super Chebyshev behavior that was earlier derived using the indice spectrum, which was sn was d square over n. Uh, it's easy to check that if I take d square and divide by n, I get exactly this exponent. And in particular, when d is equal to n, then sn is also roughly n. Uh, so at very high degree, the error is very small. So we'll do this thing. Uh, if you notice that nothing was, nothing was assumed about the integer spectrum, then that's a good observation, I guess. Uh, and exactly, this exactly works uh, uh, in, in the case of 1D Hamiltonians. So I'll explain that. Uh, so, uh, so our key technical theorem is that given any 1D frustration-free locally gapped Hamiltonian on n qubits, the ground space projector can be approximated by a degree d multivariate polynomial with error exponential small in s, where this behavior d square over n, n basically holds, uh, just like this uh, super Chebyshev behavior. One technical point is that we need d more than less more than root n less than n, which was also happening so far. So let me spend some 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 slides expanding uh, on how does this work and why it only works for one D. Uh, so we could follow the same strategy as before. We could uh, take our n q bits now. These are not classical bits anymore. These are quantum particles. They have nearest neighbor Hamiltonian interaction. Let's take n of them and let's divide them into groups of m each. And if there is a gap on spectral gap on each of these blocks then uh, one can approximate each block by the Chebyshev polynomial, just like what, what is happening in the, uh, in, the class, in, the, in, the, in the classical case. Uh, in, the, in this step where we are approximating each of these blocks with the Chebyshev polynomial, same can be done here with the local gap assumption. Now we do this, we approximate each block with a Chebyshev polynomial of with, degree, with error one over 10 with degree roughly root m. And then we would like to put these together and compose them using robust polynomial. But the issue is the following, and that's really a quantum issue, which is not there in the classical case, which is that there are, unlike the classical case, there are Hamiltonians acting also between the blocks. And the ground space is not simply a product of the ground spaces of each blue region. It's a very small subspace somewhere hidden inside because of these near, nearing quantum constraints. So, one cannot simply uh, uh, put them together. 
but cannot simply apply the robust polynomial on these things. By the way, so there's another observation that robust polynomial also works for non-commuting case, which is also non-trivial, but uh, skipping that. So the way to really fix this is to take two layers of blocks. Instead of just taking such a partition, one takes two partitions, when the blue and well overlapping red ones, and one puts them together instead of just putting the blue ones together. And it turns out that if the overlap is good enough, roughly half the length of these block, like M over two or something like that, then the product of these blue and red proje uh, projectors gives, gets us very close to the ground space, which follows by what is known as a coarse grain detectability lemma. Uh, so given this, uh, uh, I won't go into the details, but turns out that our theorem, uh, with this theorem in particular, the optimal 1D approx polynomial approximation, it follows by just repeating this process many, many times. And this works out. So uh, in order to prove the 2D area law, what we do is that we take this region around the, uh, around the cut, this effective region, and we find a way to achieve this construction along this boundary going up. We take T to be roughly a constant, which sort of makes this whole thing essentially a 1D system. If you don't think much about this part, there are ways to do that. And one thinks of N as the boundary, that's a boundary and P is a constant. And we apply the previous construction on this rough one chain, and that uh, gives the proof. So with this, uh, I'm at the end of the talk, fairly early. Uh, um, so a uh, couple of questions for future direction. So first, I guess the most important question is to remove the frustrated fr frustration to apply to frust frustrated systems, which would really require us to, uh, in fact, remove this local gap assumption that 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 I, that we had in our proof. Uh, then there's a hope to be able to prove frustrated systems. Beyond that, uh, a very interesting question is to, uh, you know, just to prove it for three-dimensional lattice, which you don't know how to do. And finally, uh, to try and prove, uh, just like in the, I, I mentioned that 1D area laws give algorithms for ground states. So one hopes that 2D area laws will also give algorithms for quantum ground states, which is a very big challenge. And, and one hopes to solve these problems. So with that, thanks for your attention. And that's basically the end of my talk. Yeah, thank you, Anurag. Uh, are there any questions to Anurag? Uh, Anurag, uh, yep. so you had this assumption, right? That H I J uh, is between zero and identity, like it's right, uh, right, in the yeah. very beginning. Yeah, yeah, in, in, in the very beginning. Uh -huh. So yeah, I'm I'm thinking, you know, like uh, is it like a physical assumption? Uh, so uh, physically, many things can happen. Like usually, uh, uh. If you look at lattice systems, like uh, you know many-body lattice systems, mm -hmm. then it's some number j here, uh, yeah, right. and, and that's and that one can uh, absorb. Uh, that's okay. That that doesn't bother. Like one can absorb in the energy. So this assumption is totally fine. I mean, one can define h prime is h over j and just work with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's and, and, you, and you have like nearest neighbor interaction, like also like the. Uh, right, like right. Yeah. Neighbor. You have like nearest But you the, mentioned the, there was the, a result by like where people had looked at the nearest neighbor case. Like you were talking about different results of, uh, I think, Itai and others and so on. In one so, day, yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think there was a slide if I remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, I, one, of the, one of them you mentioned that it was no, no, for 2D case also, like uh, you were probably. Oh, oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Spin oh. hub that is with nearest neighbor interaction. So yeah, I'm I'm just trying to see like I mean how like what is uh, what was their result like? Uh, oh, so uh, basically, Bravi had shown that uh, if you have a nearest neighbor interaction, like literally particles acting, uh, uh, you know, not even like square, rather literally two body part interaction. Uh -huh. Then then Bravi had sh shown that for qubits, one can solve this thing exactly. I see give exact solution and then this was used by these others. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But this this is, uh, I, I would say that uh, nearest neighbor one would one should think of as like this would be a nearest neighbor like because this particle has lots of neighbors, right? It's not just two neighbors. So you could imagine, for example, other configuration like some particle put, put in between and so on. Uh, this kind of argument would apply there too. Uh, 
like this was really for simplification one could assume more complicated kind of interaction like it doesn't have to be a square lattice uh, so, so so let's for example you know let's say that i take your lattice and uh, mm -hmm. fold it as a torus let's say like uh, close the boundaries like will yeah. the results hold like still there yeah 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 so that's not a problem too. So, so those things would be fine. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Yeah, mm, Anurag. Hey, so, yeah. uh, okay. So, so here, uh, uh, all right. So, oh, uh, so, so we are trying to bound the uh sort of the information between the two parts of the cut right yeah yeah hmm. mm -hmm. so so okay and one is focusing on a mutual information mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and so in case uh, let's say one tries to let's say upper also there's the issue of upper bounding right mm -hmm. so let's mm -hmm. say i want to upper bound a, a, a weaker quantity say ih or something yeah yeah. So does it turn out to be easier? Um, so uh, it turns out that it's basically the same uh, same thing. Uh, uh, it turns out that bounding IH sort of implies bounding uh, entropy, but given a good AGSP, sorry, what is it? Uh, so I didn't discuss this at all at this point, but uh, like all these results, they sort of uh, the bound IH first. That's sort of the product state, right? That's like the uh, max, the the min entropy, right? Uh huh. Uh -huh. So so bounding min entropy implies bounding entropy, um, and one can also prove it in some sense. Um, uh, like we have some results recently on that. Uh, you know, bounding so, min entropy implies bounding entropy. Uh, okay, so because you do it for closer and closer. Uh, states is it uh yeah, yeah yeah so just one second what i can do is that let me let me sh uh, stop sharing here and quickly so what happens is that um uh usually these works right they prove the following theorem which is that the entropy uh entropy of this ground state is less than this log d over log one over delta times this min entropy that you mentioned mm. Plus log d, roughly. This is what they prove. So now it depends on situation. So for example, Hastings was doing the following. He was bounding min entropy, which was easier for him. Uh, and then he, he bound min entropy by e to the power one over gap in one d. And he showed this is a constant too. Right? So he then he got the area law, right? So the entropy is bounded by something times min entropy plus something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so entropy is less than log d over log one over the shrinking delta. This is the shrinking. No, 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 no. no. This is not. This is not true in general, right? I mean, this yeah, is it's only for. It's only for. Only if you have an AGSP. Yeah. So if 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 there is an AGSP k, you know, such that k minus ground state is less than delta, and the Schmidt rank of k is d, then this happens. Ah, uh, if you have an AGSP, blah blah, then this, right? Exactly. I mean, in general, I mean, in general, bounding min entropy will not give us a bounce on entropy. For right? sure, definitely, definitely. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Uh, although it is, it is possible that, uh, for example, what we also do in this converse of the substrate theorem. Yeah. Right. That mm -hmm. is, if you, if you, so for example, like you know. Substance theorem says that if d is small, then d max epsilon is small. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the converse says that if d max epsilon is small, you know, in a uniform fashion, okay, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. every epsilon, let's say yeah. d max epsilon is smaller than k over epsilon for every mm -hmm. epsilon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Then d gets upper bounded by uh, k. Yeah. But although d max would be larger, sort of, uh, d max is larger than d, right? But here s min is. Correct, 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 correct. So it's happening at the D max epsilon. What's a D thing? Yeah. But the thing yeah. is, you you know you, you in order to upper bound, in order to upper bound, uh, 
uh, D, what you do is you upper bound D max epsilon for uniformly for all epsilon. Okay. Right, right, right. Now, uh, I, I was just wondering if you're doing this at the entropy and the min entropy end, but, uh, 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 but uh, okay, I, I don't know that. But in any case, uh, the you also have this AGSP business going on here. Yeah, there's also, so it's slightly tricky in that sense, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, now second thing is, that what about so you're doing this for unique ground state uh so right so if there is a ground state degeneracy let's yeah. say if 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 there are you know let's say i don't know r ground states like the dimension is r mm -hmm. then entropy is less than whatever before plus log r entropy of what entropy of of any ground state for all psi in the ground ground space, huh. entropy of psi a is less than area, area whatever we had. Plus. And what what happens to the uh, maximum mixed state in the ground space? Uh, for maximum mixed state, we don't know. So yeah, that's I don't know. One sec. I think I think we talked about this earlier, and uh, there might be some counter examples there. So one would want Function between A and A complement of the maximum mixed. Uh, right in the, in the in the commuting case, of course, this is bounded. Right, uh, but I think there might be some uh, counter examples even in one D. Uh, I don't remember, but it's it's not known what happens for maximum mixed. I also, see. also there's a conjecture uh, around uh, due to let me say it's because of Zeph. Which is that uh, the conjecture is that there is a basis basis of phi one phi r. It doesn't even have to be. Uh, so it should be. It doesn't even have to be an orthogonal basis, but any basis says that this is a conjecture. Says that this this is not needed. Log r is not needed. Phi i a is less than. Ah okay. okay. No, but 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 see the thing is this. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's a counterexample to this, that will be very interesting because. Oh, you mean for this one? You mean? Yeah, typically one ex would expect this to hold. No, I mean. Yeah. So why should, I think... why should it start to depend on, uh, you know, uniqueness versus number, uh, the dimension, and this and that, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think uh... if there is a counterexample, that will that will be very interesting. And the right. second thing is. See, mm -hmm. you, I mean, these area laws have these consequences for algorithms, right? Whatever these yeah. are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Your, uh, your, uh, uh, whatever you have these. Uh, uh -huh. uh, okay. So, uh, so I'm saying, Suppose you don't you don't have this AGSP thing and whatnot, right? But and somehow you're only able to upper bound say mm -hmm. IH. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does it still have a consequence for algorithms? Uh, I mean, why why are we so concerned with IE and not, for example, happy with IH, let's say? Algorithms actually actually uh, so for example in 1D, uh, we actually need S half. So you know the truth is that even Area is not enough, so we need as the Rennie entropy of order half actually uh, for algorithms. It has to be upper bounded. Yeah, 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 less than area, and which is true. So this, all these techniques, they actually show also for S half, like they show enough, right? like uniformly for all. But I don't know if the min entropy implies some things for algorithms, uh, because S half is like the Schmidt rank, right? It's sort of like a smooth Schmidt rank. And that's what we want to bound. So max. Oh, they, they, oh, they, they even require even a, like a I max to be bounded kind of thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because mm -hmm. because we roughly one wants Schmidt rank more or less to be bounded to get algorithms. And oh. and AJSP method gives that as well. But min entropy, uh, uh, I'm not sure what on itself has applications. So AGSP gives a upper bound on uh, IMAX also. I I have I have not IMAX I have. I have. Yeah. 
और इंफॉर्मेशन एंड यू सिंग दैट इट इवन गिवस एन अपर बाउंड ऑन मैक्स इंफॉर्मेशन बट नॉट मैक्स इंफॉर्मेशन मे बी आई टू यू मीन उंडेड Okay. Uh, okay. I M X epsilon is bounded. Well, I mean, mm-hmm. I M X epsilon is bounded, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I M X epsilon is bounded. Then, uh, then. Uh, ah, a, yes, yes. A lot That's of what I'm saying. saying. That's what I'm saying. That's what yeah. I'm saying. If you can bound I M X epsilon in a uniform fashion, okay, for every yeah. epsilon, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, then you can actually get a bound on I. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Okay. That's true. Okay. 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 So. Yeah. But that 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 requires a closeness in L one, by the way, huh? uh, because you guys have in L infinity closeness or something. So yeah, so one has to go from L infinity to roughly that that notion. Yeah, I agree. So starting from L infinity, one has to go to L one closeness. So that's what these things do. That's what these AGSP and what not do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I see. So so you notice here that if this is less than half. Then of course entropy is more than S min, the main entropy. Hmm. Then you see that this is the bootstrapping lemma, right? If you recall. Yeah. So this is like S min has to be less than two log b, you know, just by looking at this expression. Ah. So this whole polynomial thing. So you you guys are like doing this polynomial and better and better approximation and whatnot, right? For polynomials. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. So uh, why? Yeah. So. Yeah, so this somehow was is not working for ground space, right? I mean, maximum state. Uh, uh, yeah, that's true. It's not clear uh, what happens for ground space. And I think, okay, I'll have to remember this. Uh, I think I had a counter example, but I don't remember anymore. Counter example will be strange, you know. That means there's something strange going on there, right? Huh? But, but yeah, yeah, that's true. But I'll have to, I'll have to. Maybe it is a weak counter example, like log the number of particles. Maybe. Okay, and then you're saying that if you want to go 3D, then you need even better approximation and whatnot. Oh yeah, yeah, 3D. We don't know at all. I see. Hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, Anurag. Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. No problem. Uh, Anurag, so so, what is the deal with the stochastic Hamiltonians, not frustration free? Oh, stochastic? We don't know. I mean, I don't think there's any uh, uh, stochastic non-frustration free. Uh, it's pretty hard, right? I have no idea uh, okay. how one use it. I think it could be as hard as a general case. Even yeah. stochastic frustration free seems to be as hard as a general case. Hmm. So maybe it doesn't buy much. I'm not sure. Okay. So yeah. Uh, yeah. if there are no more questions, uh, are there any more questions? Okay. So so in that case, uh, let us all thank Anurag for the wonderful talk, and maybe we can uh, end the call. Thanks for inviting. Yeah. Thank you Anurag. Thanks. Bye bye.